Well, again, I want to thank Ron very much for a very gracious invitation to be here this morning. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a very familiar place. Uh, I see former Sunday school uh, folks and former students and current students and former colleagues at, the, at Asbury, and so it's just a very wonderful uh, opportunity for me to, to be with you, and I've been looking forward to it for the last couple of weeks for sure. There are, there are a couple of things that I want to say just by, by way of kind of uh, sort of preliminary remarks. The, there, there's a little packet of poems coming around to you, and I don't necessarily think that you'll be able to follow along at exactly the same pace that, that I'm probably going to be working through this material, but you at least will you'll, you'll understand what, what is in front of you. There are, there are a couple of poems by George Herbert, the great Anglican 17th century poet, and the very first poem that, that I will reference in this paper is George Herbert's The Altar. And the poem is in the shape of an altar. The second poem by Herbert that will kind of appear in, in this uh, paper is a, is a poem entitled Colossians 3.3, which is a brilliant poem. And you'll, you'll find that uh, in the first few poems uh, in the packet. And then the third, and, and I'm sorry for not getting these in, in better order, the third is Easter Wings. Uh, that one will be the third one that I'll touch on by George Herbert. And, and as you can see, all of the poems are pattern poems or shaped poems. And the final poem is a poem by uh, a 20th century poet, Welsh poet by the name of Dylan Thomas. Now, a couple of really important first things uh, to address. One is the very odd juxtaposition of George Herbert, this remarkable high Anglican poet, famously uh, associated with John Donne and that whole tradition of metaphysical meditative poetry in the 17th century. The other, the other writer is not exactly what you would call a, an Orthodox Christian or probably even a Christian at all. He was you know, a very great genius and a wonderful intellect and a very good poet, but he lived a life that was not, exempl not, not exemplary. Uh, he, he had a terrible drinking problem. He had just a horrible bout with a, with a kind of prolonged adolescence. I mean, Dylan Ty, he's just gotten himself in, in a lot of trouble uh, at times, particularly when he came to America to tour on the lecture circuit. Everybody wanted to hear him because he had an incredibly mesmerizing voice. If, you, if you've heard Dylan Thomas read his own poetry, it is really enchanting. And he was just gifted with just a brilliant voice, and of course, that just made his poetry all the better. But he wasn't just a voice, he was a caricature, he was a character, he was a genius, he was a poet, he was uh, any number of things. But he's not exactly somebody that would be grouped with the pious Herbert, you know. And I, I, have, I have found it useful over the last few years, uh, because I have a very intense interest in religious poetry, uh, and particularly as uh, religious poetry as it has to do with religious experience. And uh, so for the last several years, I've, I've been looking at Herbert and Emily Dickinson, another, another very heterodox kind of poet in Dickinson, American poet. Who, you know, who exactly knows what her particular religion was? I mean, she grew up in a kind of Congregationalist, Calvinist, Connecticut Valley, but she's not anybody you could pin down with respect to a, a, a definite set of religious views. Yet, of the 1,800 poems that she wrote, many, in fact, I would even dare say most poems have, or at least deploy some kind of religious imagery, introduce some kind of religious theme. She's really kind of a remarkable poet. So that was what really got me into thinking about poetry and religious experience. So I. I studied Herbert and Dickinson sort of in light of each other years ago, and I've been kind of doing some similar things since. Most recently, uh, in preparation for a conference last October in Wales, uh, I decided to think about Dylan Thomas and George Herbert in light of each other, and there are a couple of interesting connections. One is that Dylan Thomas, as you can see from the poem that you have in your packet, was influenced a little bit by George Herbert, particularly with respect to Herbert's playfulness and language. Um, George Herbert was very famous for his shaped or patterned poems, and Dylan Thomas was familiar with those. And as you can see, the Dylan Thomas poem in your packet is, is entitled Vision and Prayer. And it's a, it's a strange poem where the, the, the first six images uh, are, are shaped in, in the form of, of, of diamonds, and then you've got 
you've got uh, the, the back half of the poem that's, that's, that's shaped in the form of, of wings or hourglass shapes. We're going to talk about how to, how to kind of read the, the symbol. But what has been useful for me over the years is to read somebody who is more orthodox. The Anglican Herbert certainly would be. Although he was no um, sentimental poet. If you, if you really read Herbert uh, closely, there is a, an honest working out of his faith and his poetry, really and truly. There is a combative Herbert. There's a conflicted Herbert. There's a troubled Herbert. There's a disobedient Herbert. There, you know, there, there, what, what fascinates me about Herbert and was also the thing that sort of fascinated me about Emily Dickinson at one point is that I, I don't think that there's another poet that I know of, and I think C.S. Lewis mentions this somewhere, and I wish I could remember where in this vast outpouring of his writings he, he makes this little remark about Herbert. But he said that Herbert was the kind of poet who could make you feel what, is, what it was like to live the Christian experience as it was felt moment to moment. And just as a devotional point, the thing that, that I've been impressed by um, lately in my own faith walk God has really been trying to help me to understand what, is, what does it mean to be faithful, not, not week to week or month to month or year to year, but what does it mean to be faithful moment to moment, you know, faithful where you stand in this particular moment, and how do you remain open to His voice, His revelation in this moment and in the next moment as they turn into days and weeks and months and years and so on. So I'm fascinated by poets that tackle the question of religious experience or try to deal with the complexity of religious experience in a, in a, in a, in a pretty honest and, and, and forthright way. And I think Herbert does that, and, and in ways that are not sentimental at all, or, or sort of merely devotional, okay? He's, he's more than just a devotional poet. And then on the other hand, I think it's interesting to see all of that in Herbert in light of somebody who is not at all religious, really, but who... At, at one point decided to write a poem kind of in the tradition of Herbert, at least in terms of shaping his poems, in vision and prayer. And, and what we might be able to think about with respect to religious experience as you read one sort of more conventional Orthodox believer in light of another poet who's really struggling in many ways, I think, to understand religious truth and even deploying a lot of Christian images and, and Christian ideas, but uh, can't quite get a handle maybe on on what he's even writing about. So what I thought that I would do is start uh, with, with a couple of remarks just about religious poetry, and then, then in a more, rather more formal way, kind of begin to read this paper, which shouldn't take very long, and I'll try to read it in a way that's not hopelessly tedious. But I really appreciate all of you your, your being here. I, I just am thrilled to be here. Several years ago, and, I, and Samuel Johnson, the, the great 18th century writer, is just one of my intellectual heroes. I mean, there, there's no great secret about that. Paul Vincent and I share that love for Johnson. And Johnson's had a huge effect on, on my life, but not exactly an evangelical Christian, but, but, a, but a good Anglican and uh, um, reserved about his faith. But uh, what, a, what a remarkable thinker Johnson was. But he wrote a, a work. He wrote a number of short biographies on famous poets, lives of the poets. It's one of the great contributions to English literature. And in one of the less well-known biographical sketches of one of these poets, he says something actually quite remarkable about religious poetry. And, and you can find this comment in a work entitled The Life of Waller. A mostly forgettable poet, I think, wouldn't you say, Paul? Um, but the biography itself, these lives of the poets, is really remarkable stuff. But this is what Samuel Johnson has to say about religious poetry. He says, contemplative piety or the intercourse between God and the human soul cannot be poetical. Man admitted to implore the mercy of his creator and plead the merits of his redeemer is already in a higher state than poetry can confer. I read that several years ago and I, and I thought to myself, that's Johnson's saying that you really can't write religious poetry because you cannot improve upon revelation which is really a, an interesting point. Of course, I've spent the better part of my academic life outside of the classroom thinking about religious poetry um, and loving religious poetry. And, I, and, I, and at the same time, I, I hear this haunting voice of, of Johnson. But his reason is a solid one. If you accept that premise or the premise of his argument, it's kind of hard to refute if, if in fact, you accept his premise, which, uh, 
which I, I do with, I, I really don't, uh, but, but with great fear and trepidation, I, I disagree with, with him, who's forgotten, you who forgot more than I'll ever know. But he says the essence of poetry, he's, Johnson says, is invention. Such invention as by producing something unexpected, surprises and delights. The topics of devotion are few, and being few are universally known. But few as they are, they can be made no more. They can receive no grace from novelty of sentiment and very little from novelty of expression. You cannot improve upon divine revelation. You cannot write out of a sense of surprise or a sense of delight because what is already upon you in the form of, re of religious revelation goes infinitely beyond what you, could, what you could simply capture by invention. So that said, I think I'm going to talk about religious poetry now. <laughs> um, but I take the first part of my title from Dylan Thomas's uh, author's prologue to his collected poems, 1934 through 1952. And the other connection between, by the way, and it's a loose one, the other connection between Herbert and Thomas is that we're both Welsh. Um, this, this conference that I attended in, in uh, Wales last October was just exactly roughly where Herbert's whole family grew up, on the Welsh borderlands uh, between England and Wales there. And, uh, but I take the first part of this title from, from Dylan Thomas's uh, collected poems. And he says this, he writes, Look, I build my bellowing ark to the best of my love. As the flood begins out of the fountainhead of fear, rage red, man alive, molten and mountainous to stream, over the wound asleep, sheep white hollow farms to whales in my arms. Well, this is just a short passage from the prologue, but it conveys a sense of the voice and anguish that's so very characteristic of Thomas's poetry. He announces that he will, quote, ride out alone, and then under the stars of whales cry multitudes of arcs. Part of his struggle then, and, and this is what attracted me, is with language, with the limitations of knowing and saying, of tongue-tied and groping attempts to spell religious experience, something that you've all have tried to do, particularly in a tradition that, that emphasizes a, a profound exp experiential aspect of faith. Here is the point at which reading Dylan Thomas's poetry can be another way of locating George Herbert. Both poets encounter intensely paradoxical struggles for voice and meaning. For Thomas, poetry is a passage, a channel, a, even a charm to otherworldly re realities. Yet, as a juggler of language, and I, I really think that he is, Herbert, too, knows something about the charms and knots of language and experience. In fact, he even has a poem entitled Charms and Knots. For Herbert, while poetry is ultimately a path to God, it often enacts struggles with language as a result of pain and anguish, Failure and disappointment, joy and exaltation. In this essay, I want to consider how the struggle to speak amidst very intense religious experiences figures as a key aspect of religious sincerity in their poetry, particularly in their shaped or patterned poems. As a religious poet, Herbert turned to puzzles and riddles and parables and allegories and fables to test the limits of the word. Poems such as Paradise, Jesu, Love, Joy, while not as explicitly shaped as the altar in your packet or Easter wings, demonstrate his tendency to play with language in an effort to discover its proper shape and its ultimate meaning. Shaped poems really do represent a kind of playfulness in language, a, a, a mode of experimentation, a, a dialectical interplay, if you will, between imaginative conceiving and verbal activity. Helen Wilcox, who's a very good Herbert scholar, by the way, uh, contends that for 17th century poets, such verbal activity was a central part of understanding the divine. Words were perceived as a kind of incarnation of the spiritual and the physical realm and the means by which one might paradoxically give expression to that which is beyond expression. Yet shaped poems also test the limits of this verbal activity and, and invite different modes of interpretive awareness, as you can see even in your first responses to how these things appear to you on the page. The first is that shape, visual form, conveys theme. Seeing the form initiates the process of trying to make sense of it, first, though, with the eyes, then with the ears. Herbert's hieroglyphs, as Martin Elsky has pointed out, spell out God's word by building up letters into pictures in language. And, and uh, those, those pictures merge nature and history with the poet's spoken utterances as they're recorded in, in written, uh, written language or written words. The poem, thus, becomes a symbol 
or a, a kind of sign in the sky transmitting a divine message even before it's read, right? Even non-verbally it's communicating with you before you even read the language. The poem hieroglyph appears as a letter in a divine alphabet, but one that must be investigated, closely examined, and integrated into experience. Yet the shaped poems of Herbert and Thomas, I will go on to say, often, and this is what fascinates me, often relocate the poet and the reader very unexpectedly sometimes outside of the coordinates that integrate experience. They can, they can produce moments of real um, cognitive struggle and difficulty as we're trying to figure out what's just happened to us as we receive revelation. Shaped poems also convey metaphorical meaning, of course. As uh, For Herbert, they embody complex metaphorical meanings that have to do with such things as religious conversion, poetic development, visionary and linguistic ascent, Dale, I think of you there, even social obligations. The altar, for example, the, the little poem in the shape of the altar or the shape of the eye, establishes a sacred space, broken and whole, if you read it carefully, as Kathleen, Kathleen Lynch has observed, through which the speaker in anguish struggles to understand the self in relation to God. The, at first glance, the poem takes the shape of a classical altar or a Eucharistic table, but it also appears in the shape of the pronoun I. Bo uh, thus underscoring both verbally and visually the call for the speaker to understand himself only in right relationship to God, that the I that I need to know about is the I that only God helps me to discover and not the egotistical I, and to respond to the fact expressed in Christian doctrine that a loving, broken, penitent heart is the proper shape of devotion. This is familiar territory in Herbert studies, and it's very familiar territory to us. The altar opens the church his big body of poetry, as a reminder of Herbert's commitment to what John Hollander called the authenticity of form. Achieving form reflects, though, in Herbert, an ordeal with language. Uh, Lynch explains that the altar marks this great metaphoric gap which inescapably divides a word from reference as various as the generic tradition, objects of representation, and the matter of sacramental presence. Yet achieving the form also unfolds as an ordeal of experience and perception. Now, this is where I have to stop and say, I am, I am an interloper in all sorts of ways this morning. One, as an English professor coming to a theological dialogue, you always have to be careful, right? Um, uh, we, we just transgress um, all sorts of inter uh, uh, disciplinary boundaries. Um, but I also want to say that uh, I'm also a bit of an interloper when it comes to literature and philosophy. I, I love philosophy and I love its intersection with literature. Um, and particularly lately about how... Uh, how phenomenology, which is really the study of modes of perception, how we see things, and how we, how we know what we've experienced, you know, how, how we become conscious of what we've experienced, and the conditions for the possibility of being able even to claim that you've had an experience. So that's what phenomenology does. So this paper sort of reflects a phenomenological reading of Herbert and, and Dylan Thomas. So the, this, the, the altar and these shape poems invite, really, a phenomenological approach that attends to the arising of certain epiphanic moments, epiphanies, which sometimes fall outside of the coordinates or the outline of our horizon of expectations. And actually, this has happened to us. We, we sort of pray and pray and pray, and we, it appears that nothing happens. And then sometimes, and this has happened to me, where I sort of, the moment where I sort of cease to pray, it's almost all of a sudden that in my very ceasing begins a new prayer that I didn't even know that I was offering up to God. Something's happened to my heart. I, I don't know what, but I, there's a, an arriving of a revelation that, that I actually didn't expect. Okay? So that's where phenomenology becomes a very fascinating thing to try to get descriptions of how that works. And um, so religious poems, particularly prayer poems, which include most, if not all, of Herbert's and some of Thomas's, open up with added intensity the struggle for voice in religious experience. Prayer is a religious encounter like none other. An activity of radical exposure, if we're praying the right way, Involving voice and suffering and disappointment and failure and ecstasy all at the same time at, at times. By this very movement and expectation for meaning, and we all have an expectation when we pray, 
Uh, prayer includes a whole range of complex thoughts and emotions, too, which feature as a part of a very paradoxical call-response structure. The petitioner prays, in other words, and hopes for an answer. Yet this call-response pattern hinges, at least from this particular way of reading poems, on making sense of religious phenomena, how and when, in other words, experience counts as experience, and whether it is sincere. I mean, I even made the remark when, we, when I was here on a much wetter day at the dedication that uh, I think I said something about the Welsh revival, where people really believed that, that uh, fire had fallen from heaven. Well, how do you talk about that? <laughs> how do you register that? How do you, what, what kind of pressure does that put on language to say that you have just felt liquid love? I have. But how do you, how do you talk about that? The language of prayer, uh, well, let me, let me say, this call-response pattern hinges on making sense of religious phenomena. How and when, in other words, experience counts actually as experience and whether it's sincere experience. The language of prayer undergoes a tremendous ordeal as it develops because of its exposure to what it cannot size up in language. For this reason, I, I wanted to bring Herbert and Thomas into focus as poets whose language encounters a disruption often in the, in the struggle and search for voice, an experience that a French phenomenologist by the name of Jean-Louis Chrétien calls wounded speech. Uh, by that he means that religious utterance, vocalized prayer, contemplative reading, mental prayer, a religious poem like the kind that you have in your hands, belongs not to the called, but to the caller, namely God. Now, you've got to think about that for a while because what that does is it makes you very immediately aware sometimes of how we try to handle God, you know? Uh, we, to, in the language of phenomenology, how you might phenomenalize something, turn it into an object so you can manage it. Well, what happens, though, if the one doing the calling is already upon you even as you're trying to speak? Sort of already present in, 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 in the very act of speaking. What happens? Are there marks at the level of language that sort of begin to suggest that even, even as we begin to bow our heads and, and, uh, um, and, and pray, that our language is already uh, almost pales in comparison to the one uh, who's calling us. And I, what I like about that is, it, is it, it keeps open the huge, you know, it, it makes God, you know, at least it accounts for the fact that God is so much bigger sometimes than our little attempts to, to organize him too neatly into all the ways that are satisfying to us, right? And so this is one of the applications, I think, that phenomenologists are, uh, at least for theological purposes, this is what's interesting to me. Such a wound results from the manifestation, ultimately, of unfathomable love. Other phenomena appear in religious responses, but love comes into play dramatically in prayer. Chrétien's idea of wounded speech provides a pathway for thinking in a new way about religious encounters and voice in Herbert and Thomas and how such moments reveal a felt desire for religious uh, sincerity. This is a fascinating subject. When you, when you say somebody is sincere in his faith, what do you mean by that? And it's just a, it's, it's a much more philosophic question than, than, than pay, maybe if it first meets the eye. But if you would, look at the altar, and then flip over to Colossians 3.3. Like the altar, Herbert's Colossians 3.3 opens a root into this question. <clears throat> a more subtly patterned poem, Colossians 3.3, finds its life in the Word of God, embedded in the poem. Now, now, just notice that the poem has embedded in it the actual biblical verse, Okay? Important here is that the words at the center of the acrostic, watch this, are the words in him. And they correspond, as Robert McMahon and others have shown, with the central rhymes, earth and birth. Taken together, these words call attention to the reality of the incarnation, while also revealing the struggle of the speaker to understand its implications. So this Herbert speaker says, my God, I'm sorry, my words and thoughts do both express this notion of 
that life hath with the sun a double motion. The first is straight and our diurnal friend, the other hid and doth obliquely bend. Our life is wrapped in flesh and tends to earth, the other winds towards him whose happy birth taught me to live here so, that still one eye should aim and shoot at that which is on high, quitting with daily labor all my pleasure to gain at harvest an eternal treasure. The fall obviously dominates the first half of the poem in which a gap or a wound opens up between earthly, fleshly, and heavenly spiritual meaning. Both speaker's words and his thoughts, his conceiving, that is, descend into the flesh, temporal, worldly, mortal, yet the lines, even from the start, participate in the revelation of Christ. The speaker is hid in the redemptive body of Christ, just as the lines are hid in the form of the poem without which the poem would point to earth and ultimately to death. The uplift of the poem is possible because of the downward movement of Christ's condescension, that old theological descriptor for the incarnation, which I think is sort of interesting. In metaphoric terms, the double motion of the physical sun leads to the sun that is Christ, whose bodily presence in the world, his incarnation, turns descent into ascent, death into life, and time into eternity, as McMahon adds. Yet Colossians 3.3, a poem of contemplative reading, shows that the speaker, in the wrestling with the finitude of his own language, undergoes a break in speech or a wounding of language which paradoxically opens the very possibility of speaking. In this way, the poem does not so much begin then as immediately respond in dialogue with God who speaks first. The first word, my, a personal pronoun of possession, Control, initiative, self, perhaps even of egotism and autonomy. Voice is a declaration, but simultaneously registers the loss of self-reliance before the revelation of the word in poetic speech. At once paradoxical and physiological, God's word is made flesh then and sustained through the voice of the speaker whose words are given shape, interpreted by the word of God. For Thomas, his shaped poems, religious and form embody religious struggle too, while also serving as a metaphor for the growth of the poet, the splendor of nature, the uncertainty of life, the possibility of despair. And if you turn to vision and prayer for a minute, that would be great. In 1945, is by comparison with Thomas's other religious poems, more positive and assertive. But it still depends for its meaning on, on the intimacy between form and meaning. As with Herbert, Thomas encounters intense moments of religious experience. Influenced by Herbert's shaped poems, especially by Easter Wings, Vision and Prayer is composed of two parts, consisting of six diamond-shaped poems and six wing-shaped poems or hourglass-shaped poems, whichever one you want to work with. The vision poems are diamonds, the prayer poems are wings. Reading Thomas's Vision and Prayer in light of Herbert's religious poems provides another way of seeing what is at stake in prayer poems. Thomas's religious encounters take on a remarkable intensity, especially when one considers how he, like Herbert, confronts the limitations of language, the sudden reversals of understanding, disappointment, failure, and ecstasy. Vision prayer follows the arc from birth to death, starting with the first of the diamond poems in part one. As in Herbert, shaped form immediately draws attention to the ordeal of finding voice. In Thomas's poem, the speaker faces the birth of his child, once hidden in the dark womb, now revealed. And look at, look at how oddly shaped these are. Who are you who is born in the next room so loud to my own that I can hear the womb opening and the dark run over the ghost and the dropped sun behind the wall thin as a wren's bone? In these lines, in the agony and anticipation of the moment, the parents wait anxiously for the birth of the child. Just as they wait for the child, the poet waits for the poem, for meaning to manifest itself, to respond to experience. Yet in the process... The child's birth occasions a series of complex thoughts, reactions, and feelings, all of which are entangled with an emerging religious vision and prayer, prompted, it seems, by the incarnation of the, of the Christ child in part two of the poem. And I don't pretend to, 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 to say that this isn't really odd on Thomas's part, but interestingly so. He says here, writes, In the birth bloody room unknown to the burn and turn of time and the heart print of man Bows no, baptism, bows no baptism blessing on the wild child. The poem sharpens to a point. It descends to the word child, the Christ child, 
who seems to promise a light to which the poet, the poet's child, and the poem seek to make ascent. The upsailing, quote, the spiritual ascension later described in Diamond Poem 5. Yet the ascent is frustrated. The whole sequence of poems grows difficult. Even the last diamond poem linking birth and death, poetry and pain, ends ultimately on a very dark note, signaled by the phrase, wound word flight, occurring earlier in the poem. For Thomas, as is true for Herbert at times, epiphany occasions bewilderment, even announces death. Yet through the experience, the ordeal of language and voice is felt in the poet's response to Revelation, but not before altering him, and this is what I found interesting upon looking at the poem more carefully, but not before altering the speaker, before the magnitude of the very experience that he was trying to write about. And the line reads like this, and I pulled Paul Vincent aside the other few weeks back, or well, months back now, and asked him if he heard the same thing. And, and uh, so we got to talking about it. But the line reads like this, like the happening of saints to their vision. Just an interesting way, word order like the happening of saints to their vision. Vision seems almost to, to be felt in the very happening, right? The, the overwhelming presence of what calls the saint seems to be upon the saint even before the saint begins to know what's happening. Such moments of epiphany deepen a sense of the complexity, the complex nature of religious experience in both poets. As an event of perception, though, and this is where it gets a little strange for me because I grew up reading poems very formally. So if you, if you start entertaining the notion that, that poems can be read as events of perception and not just as ontological objects, it, it gets you to think about some different things. So as an event of perception, as a, well, as a, as a form of poetic meaning, vision prayer responds to the visitations of meaning that bear down on the language as is suggested by the very shape of the poet. In terms of the metaphor of the womb, and I can't speak from experience exactly, but it seems to me that my wife was doing a lot of bearing down when our kids were born. The downward pressure opens the womb, but it also opens the wound of language here. And, and Dylan Thomas writes, and the whole pain flows open and I die. Womb-like both in shape, suggest suggestiveness, and in imaginative fecundity, Thomas's poem enacts the painful birth of the child, of the self, of the poem, an agony described in, in the language of the second diamond poem as at once generative and religious. And this is one, one of the lines in, in the poem reads this way, and the shadowed head of pain casting tomorrow like a thorn. Muriel Spark once observed that in vision and prayer, the varying forms of the stanzas, and of course you'll, you'll notice how different they are, the extension and contraction of the first line of each part in section one of the diamond-shaped poems may be taken to represent the spasms of the womb attendant on delivery. The shaping, the casting of the poem depends on suffering, even religious suffering as the speaker identifies with Christ's crown of thorns. The image of the shadowed head of pain, this is where Thomas gets a little strange, reinforces the agony of the poet's thought process, the risk and vulnerability of bringing an idea to birth, which is actually a very old form of thinking about how ideas make their way out into the world, like they're birthed, right? Very common in the Renaissance even. But it delicately, this shadowed head of pain also delicately but pointedly suggests that the diamond-shaped anterior fontanelle, the soft spot, on a baby's head, the bony plates that allow a child's head to flex during its passage through the birth canal. So it's interesting that Thomas is using this kind of anatomical image to talk about how, 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 how a poem came into being. What is striking, however, is that Thomas's vision and prayer not only recalls Herbert's legacy for verbal experimentation, but also highlights the paradoxical struggle, not just for truth, not just for truth, as Chrétien might say, but with truth with understanding what just happened to you. So vision and prayer in particular, as well as Herbert's Easter wings, reinforces this kind of ordeal in speech. And I'm almost done. Thomas's second winged shaped poem registers such an encounter with particular force. So if you look at the second wing shaped poem for a minute, 
that he, in the, in, the, in the last part of it, that he who learns now the sun and moon of his mother's milk may return before the lips blaze and bloom to the birth bloody room behind the walls wren, bone and be dumb and the womb that bore four, or I said the first part of the poem, excuse me. Unspeakable pressure, intense upward and downward movement, in a sense, extends through the course of the whole sequence. Through vision and prayer, the Christ child remains analogous to Thomas's son, perhaps to Thomas as son infant, representing a promise of light and hope to the world by means of the poetic word. Yet the experience alters a voice and exposes the limits of language, uh, the phrase bone and be dumb, right? I can't speak. The first half of this shaped poem, read in the form of either a wing the top of an hourglass or an inverted diamond half applies pressure on the poets conceiving at the epiphanic moment of the arriving sun. Hey, I was at a loss for words when my kids were born too. You know, my daughter especially, right? I mean, just so much more beautiful. I, I remind my son of this occasion. But you, you know, you really sort of get the sense that they were trailing on clouds of glory, you know, you know on their way to your arms. And I couldn't speak. I think I was sobbing. I mean, I, you know that moment. Um, well, is there something like, is, is there something similar in, in revelatory moments when something comes to us? Uh, so uh, Thomas is sort of working with this image of birth, but he goes on to say this about the, the moment, the, the epiphany, if you will, of the arriving son. And notice the play on language here. It's his own son. But is he also thinking that it was, is, is he's trying to figure out how he relates to Christ and, and the Son of God and as the Son of God. So he says this, or writes, all men the adored infant light or dazzling prison yawn to his upcoming in the name of the wanton lost on the unchristened mountain. And here's the line that I just really stuck out to me. In the center of dark, I pray him. In the center of dark, I pray him him. If I were writing that, I would have added a preposition, I think, and maybe quite wrongly. I would have said, in the center of dark, I pray to him, or I mean, it's a conspicuous loss of the, of the word to there. The effect of the arriving sun is disorientation. As the poet prays to Christ for, child's, or for Thomas's own child or for himself, he experiences, and again, Thomas had this kind of uh, he had a little bit of a childlike demeanor, so he was sort of sometimes referring to himself as a child, which is, again, part of just the somewhat strange uh, aspect to his uh, biography. But he experiences a bewilderment of light or a dazzling prison, which he says, in reality, describes the whole sequence of diamond poems. If you look at a diamond, every facet of it throws light in different directions. Okay? And, by the way, diamonds are formed under pressure. So you get the diamond and the womb and, I mean... Uh, all bearing down on the imagination here, even. As in Diamond Poem 4, later in the sequence, the poet's words respond paradoxically to an experience beyond words. Quote, Thomas writes, And the finding one and the high noon of his wound blinds my cry. The agonizing last word, cry, ushers in a moment of inexhaustible meaning felt in the very cry itself. Moments such as these provide a glimpse into the richness of experience in the poetry of Herbert and Thomas, and distinguish them as poets who confront the demands of achieving religious sincerity through the language of hard-won experience. And here's um, really kind of the last uh, page or so. In vision and prayer, then, each poem in the sequence, in a different way, answers another, and forms yet another poem that throws light, radiant, brilliant, blinding, in another direction on another facet of experience. The second half of, the dime, of Diamond Poem 2 produces a, a growing uncertainty at the search for meaning and voice. In the center of dark, I pray him. The loss of the preposition to in the concluding line, unfolding as it does at the extreme verge of the poem, further suggests a wounding, a moment of excess. It seems to make visible in the center of dark an arriving phenomenon that exceeds his description. It's almost as if he's saying, in the center of dark, I pray him. Did something come to him in that moment? In the space between pray and him? Did something break over that horizon and, 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 and impress something upon him? And is that why the ending of the, of the line seems almost like it's missing something in the way of human speech? Is there something 
of the hymn that's already kind of bearing down in that moment of darkness when he's trying to pray, that, that, that is uh, affecting him before he has a chance to even speak it. That's the wound that Chrétien is talking about. Um, well, let, let me uh, just finish up. The loss of the, this preposition, uh, just for the expected child, Christ, the poet's child, the poet, the poem, conveys meaning irreducible to form and language. Yet admits pain or perhaps because of it, the poet senses the arrival of wonder. I think of Dr. Jim Hamilton, who, who got me thinking years ago about wonder, more philosophically than I'd ever done before. William Moynihan points out wonder, the arrival of wonder. At this point, however, the speaker struggles to respond in speech to what has already rendered it insufficient, to cross the distance between his response and what arises so suddenly. Uh, and in and, and another place in the poem... I, Thomas writes, I turn the corner of prayer and burn in the blessing of the sudden sun. I burn the blessing of the sudden sun. In vision and prayer, as in Herbert's poems, the unexpected lurks around every corner. And what this does, I think, is sort of preserves for us a sense of, at the very least, of the marvelously mysterious way in which God, God's revelation can occur. There's not a person in this room who probably hasn't encountered a very significant revelatory presence of God's, you know, God's revelatory presence even in the most ordinary of moments. When does it happen? How does it happen? And how do you know that it's happened? And how do you have a language to talk about its arrival? Um, openness to religious encounter then locates Herbert in Thomas's poetry. There's the intertextual connection, I guess. Yet the two poets respond to religious experience in voices distinctly their own. In part two of Thomas's vision and prayer, the poet's prayer ascent, his struggle for meaning, his ambiguous faith, the poem itself requires not eagle's wings, as in, in, in Herbert's Easter wings, but vulture's wings, the dark birds of prey. In, Thomas's, or in prayer, Thomas's speaker alerts the reader to the prospects of isolation in the dark. And he writes here, in the name of the lost who glory in the swinish plains of Kerry and under the burial song, heavy with the drowned and the green dust and bearing the ghost from. This passage conveys the promise and potential to be sure, green dust and bearing the ghost. But it's difficult to know whether the ghost here is the pantheistic spirit uh, that Thomas might have been interested in, moving through all things, as Wordsworth used to say, or the Holy Ghost hovering over all creation, as Milton might say. While the second half of the poem arises in expansion and takes flight, it does so only like pollen on the black plume and the, ble and the beak of slime. This is the darker side of Thomas. The poem prayer has taken wing, but unlike Herbert now, on alienation and uncertainty. Of birth and death, the speaker confesses that while he prays, he prays in the isolation of his own encounter with an experience he does not understand. Now, I'll make a, devotional, uh, a more explicit devotional point here. One of the ways in which I felt God was calling me back to Himself was I was in a very unlikely religious moment, <laughs> let's put it that way, when somebody was, I actually think it was a party, and somebody was saying derogatory things about Jesus. And I just sort of stood up and just kind of was, just went into attack mode, you know. How dare you say this? And, you know, I just was going on and on and on and on and on, and I'm thinking... Why am I doing this? Why am I, doing, why, why am I making such a big deal out of this? In other words, it was almost as if the arriving sun was already upon me, even as I was beginning to sort of struggle to speak. It was almost a kind of prayer, the argument that I was in, you know? And, uh, and I relate to this line in Thomas, which may be one of the more famous and more memorable. He says, I pray, though I belong not wholly to that lamenting. It's kind of a beautiful word, isn't it? I pray, though I belong not wholly to that lamenting. Now, you could, you could take it two ways. You could say, somehow I find myself praying, even though I don't belong to, to the Christian confession, you know, Either, even though I don't somehow believe in this. But I'm praying anyway. Well, again, it seems ambiguous and difficult. But I'm, I'm wondering if there may not necessarily be a way that you can actually say that sometimes that can be a sign of religious sincerity when somebody out of the, the most extreme and desperate moment is praying because he has no, no idea what else to do. 
You know, Chesterton once said, the, the trouble with the atheist is as soon as he wants to give thanks for something, he turns around and there's no one to thank. Our speaker yesterday in chapel, Baltimore Colts football player in 1975, which happened to be my favorite team, by the way, um, said that, you know, what brought me to faith was uh, sitting at the deathbed of my brother, not knowing what to tell him as he was dying. I pray, I pray, though I belong not wholly to that lamenting. Well, is that the place where the prayer begins? Here is prayer, wounded speech, a response to a call that the poet is unable to identify or describe in language, at least immediately. Yet it is a moment of authentic religious encounter, it seems to me. It enacts the paradox that prayer often begins at the very moment when the one praying says he cannot pray. A paradox at work in Herbert's poetry, even in Easter Wings. I, I even have moments like these where you, where you begin to pray, and, uh, or you're, you're in worship, actually, sadly. And you begin to pray, and you're thinking about uh, a class that you have to teach next hour. And yet you're uttering a prayer. And then you have to stop. You have to stop. And you just sort of wonder whether it's the moment when your voice stops that God's, you know, God's promptings you know, get you to the second half of your prayer, which are, which are a more direct response to, to the call. But the call has already come, right? Even in your ability to say to yourself, wow, I, I'm not thinking about my prayer at all. But the one, the one calling me overwhelms my own address. See? Uh, well... In the extreme moments of prayer, in the narrowest, most impoverished moments, if you look at Herbert's Easter Wings for a minute, which I think is the very first poem, notice the shortest lines. Most poor, most thin. Herbert's speaker discovers with surprise that in his language, that his language is in dialogue with what gives it proper shape and meaning. It may be in, in the moments when we feel most poor and most, most impoverished and most thin uh, as C.S. Lewis, I think, said that maybe it's in the driest season when our prayers count the most somehow, if you can talk about it that way, and I think you know what I mean, at least figuratively by that. But Thomas's vision and prayer is less assured than Easter wings, that's for sure, but no less authentic in its search for voice, at least. By the end, and I'm almost done, I promise, by the end of Thomas's poem, the speaker discovers his identity, the I, as the turning point of the poem, and its concluding lines suggest that he has been found and this is also true of my own experience, perhaps where he least wanted to be found, in the midst of the sudden sun, the finding one of Diamond Poem 4. The poem contracts in pain, at which point the speaker utters, I am found. The petitioner is found by the loud sun who christens down the sky, yet the poem expands into a space of potential uplift, the expanding wing, or perhaps in the expanding space of time run out, if the hourglass shape predominates, time still seems to signal death as the movement of birth is the first step toward the grave. But the anguished cry voiced in Diamond Poem 4 is heard again at the close of the poem. Quote, his lightning answers my cry. My voice burns in his hand. Now I am lost in the blinding one. The sun roars at prayer's end. The language here bears the marks of a very serious struggle, a religious experience in which our truth is at stake. Our truth is at stake, you know. But this now seems to be the moment Thomas wants, perhaps the moment he's most afraid of, the moment of the sincerest adoration, possibly. Anyway, thank you for listening to all of that. I'd be happy to continue the dialogue here in the form of questions and, and whatever if you have them. Don't let Dr. Vincent ask me too many questions about phenomenology, though, okay? because I'm only about two, two answers away from, from being found out as being a philosophical interloper, either you, especially you. Uh, but anyway, is there any response to that? Any, any, am I way off? Go ahead. Well, I mean, I think to, to, to again, to use the language, a uh, more devotional language that we're, that we're all, you know, sort of very familiar with, it, it's, it's just the moment, for instance, where we might feel um, the real presence of the Holy Spirit, for instance. Um, 
I, I'm, just, I'm just beginning to suggest, though, that at least from this kind of approach, that, that one way of, of keeping in front of us the magnitude of that, and I think sometimes we can treat it too, in a too pedestrian fashion. I think we can, we can, we can handle these remarkable moments a little too casually. And so what's interesting about Chrétien is that he always kind of keeps open that moment when uh, that the one that we, that we want to call is already before our call calling us. And there are just where in language do you see the marks of the one calling I'm sorry, of the, of the one who's called as, um, as bearing down on us, or uh, to put it another way, and this is the way Chrétien puts it, when do you ever discover that your, your prayer is pray to the one that you're praying to? And, and it's a very abstract way of putting it, and I don't mean to pretend that it's any less abstract. Some of this stuff is just... I mean, you read five pages of phenomenology and your brain just throbs, you know. But they're, but they're trying to figure out a language to describe little moments of transaction with those conditions for experience that are indicated by language. Another way of, of, of saying this is that um, I, had, I had the good fortune of, of, of hearing Kevin Hart, who's just a brilliant guy at the University of Virginia, talk about, uh, oh, and I wish I had brought... The, the poem, but some of you know the poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins called God's Grandeur, right? Uh, it's, a, it's an incredible poem. Um, and, you know, there's, you could, you could, I suppose you could say that it's a poem, sort of, uh, this would be a terribly reductive way of reading it, but it's about, you know, the Trinity. Well, uh, okay, but, but it's not about the Trinity as dogma. It's actually about how the speaker of the poem is ex experiencing the triune God, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy, in, in, as it sweeps through his experience. Now, try capturing that in language. The dearest freshness, deep down things. You know, it's God's transcendence coming through this kind of imminence. But, but to capture it phenomenologically, you almost have to say then that Gerard Manley Hopkins is performing his own... Um, Reduction, that is trying to get phenomenology, the best I can understand it to this point, is really trying to open as many windows as possible and to allow things to arrive in the mode of their own appearing so that you can actually see them with a kind of pristine wonder again. To keep open the idea that, that things, ar phenomena arrive in the mode of their own arriving. And are we prepared to see them in the mode of their own arriving? Or do things prevent us from seeing that? And so when you, when you read poems sort of phenomenologically like this, you, you have to say, I, I'm, I'm wondering if... Uh, oh, I did bring a copy of, of uh, that Hopkins poem. Let me just... Do I have just a, a minute or two? Okay. Um, let me... Uh, I didn't think I was going to do this. I'm scrambling here. Just bear with me as I... I find my way to this poem. I think he's actually included the, the whole thing here. Yeah. Um, th this is Hopkins, a Jesuit priest. I love Hopkins, right? The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. And all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And all for this nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went, ah, morning, at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods, with warm breast and with, ah, bright wings. I mean, what's happening in lines like, uh, uh, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, 
Because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with ah, bright wings. What's behind the ah? The arrival of something that is already kind of overwhelming the poet's ability to sort of speak. Is that a wounding too? That, that moment in life? Is that some indication of, of, the, of the pressure that he feels with? And, and what's so, this is a sonnet. So you have God the Father in the form of flaming out like shook foil. And again, I hate to reduce it just to these terms, but God the Father in judgment, actually, and sovereignty flaming out like shining with shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil. And then the enjammed word crushed, second person of the Trinity, Christ crushed, oozing like oil, right? The anointing oil. Why do men then not wreck his rod? And then the sestet. As you work through the problem, and this is sort of a large commentary on the problem of Victorian culture and so on, but you work down through the sestet, and he discovers, uh, like Wordsworth, who told us, right, he told us um, that uh, we lay waste our power, getting and spending, we just ruin nature. Well, Hopkins is saying, yeah, sure we ruin nature, but look, look, look even deeper, and you're, dis- you're going to discover something that's just something that can't be exhausted. And what you meet is the power of God triune God moving through experience and restoring, refreshing, and discovering the dearest freshness deep down things. That's the sacramentality of Hopkins, isn't it? But, uh, but it's, it's like a moment of epiphany at the end, really, I think. And ah, bright wings. I mean, I mean you, can, you can sort of leave it at, at the level of, of, a, of a, a formal line, but what's behind the ah? Poets don't use exclamation points very often. I, ne- I hate them. I tell my students never to use them unless, as E.B. White says, the universe is on fire, <laughs> right? So there, there is this kind of, uh, you know, that's what I, what I mean, those little moments of that, that language tries to kind of capture something that's, that's happened. I, I mean, I have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with phenomenology because I really am much more of a philosophical realist in the tradition of a kind of a Johnson or a Chesterton or a Lewis or whatever, and not, not so, I'm not so Kantian. And I think you have to kind of bring forward uh, Kant's apparatus for thinking about the conditions for having experience. And uh, I'm using that more heuristically than I am using it uh, dogmatically. You know, I, I'm not a big fan of, of Kant. But he, he has supplied us with some interesting language to talk about the conditions by which we know we can have experiences. Right? I mean, that's just sort of some of the fine-tuning that he did, however... Um, much he never left his office, it seems like, and just wrote philosophy on and on without end, it seemed like. So anyway, uh, anything else? Yes, Dale. Boy. Paul, Dale, Dale wants to know whether, whether in any Wesley's sermons or in any of Charles Wesley's hymns, did they ever refer either directly or indirectly to uh, Herbert or Dunn or... I mean, I, I'm, I'm almost nearly certain that, that Wesley liked Herbert. I, I, I can't... I, I, I wish I could point to the exact chapter and verse. Paul, help us there. Is, I, I've got to believe that, right? As an Anglican priest, surely... He would, have, he would have been familiar. But I don't know that for a fact. Um, I'm not sure. I had the feeling that he didn't really talk about poetry very much. He was more, more interested in the, uh, that film material. Well, the thing that has attracted me to this, I mean, we've all had very intense religious encounters. I mean, it's, it's uh, part of our Wesleyan... Uh, understanding of, of um, the Christian faith, that we have these moments of crisis and we have these moments of profound redemption. I, for one, uh, I mean, I know what Charles Finney means when he talks about liquid love. I have a hard time producing the language that perfectly describes what happened to me that night. Uh, but, but uh, you know, it's adequate language and good language and great theological language out there. But it would be interesting to know as I look back at that night in the cabin, which is all part of my own testimony, at what moment did that arrive? Did he arrive? And by the way, you know what happened after I finished this paper? A most brilliant insight by one of the, one of the people listening to it, and I wish I had made this connection. 
But you know what he kept, he kept hearing as I went back and forth between the Herbert and the Thomas? The phrase, in him. This intertextual connection between the in him in Herbert and the in him in Thomas. Wow, I've got to go back and work that out. I mean, you can talk about the intertextual connections between poets even when you, you don't talk about necessarily direct influences. But that's an interesting phrase, re recurring phrase, because it has everything to do with what I just talked about with the incarnation, the birth of the sun. You know, it, it's uh, kind of startling when uh, I heard that. Um, I don't know if that, uh, Dale, if you find any reference to the metaphysicals, let me, let me know about that. Aaron. Well, and, 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 you know, frankly, without, you know, Charles Wesley's hymns could only be described really as great poems. I mean, right? I, I, I go back to Charles Wesley a lot uh, with, with, with respect to wanting a theological vocabulary. Whew, wow. He's, he just is memorable in terms of the way in which his poetical, musical utterances sort of capture such rich aspects of, of experience. You know, and that's interesting because I don't know of anybody who would read Paradise Lost as a devotional work. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, that's just, it's a huge, epic poem, philosophical, encyclopedic. But I don't sit down with Milton for devotions. You know, I'll sit down with Herbert and read some of those poems in devotion, but not Milton, right? Um, that, I mean, so that's really interesting that he carried around, I mean, he's a great, you know, Christian man, great Christian thinker, but uh, it'd be interesting to know what part of Milton really resonated with, with Wesley the most. Obviously, the, the, the Puritan, you know, emphasis, but uh, it'd be interesting to know what, uh, what's going on there in his head, carrying around a copy of Paradise Lost. Yeah, but you know, the, wow, you know, Milton is not exactly orthodox on the question of the, of the Trinity. I mean, he's not, I don't think he's Arian, I really don't. I mean, I think that much has been made of that that the, somehow the Father and the Son are not co-equal members of the Trinity. But he might be something like a subordinationist, you know, that, uh, but he was such a huge defender of liberty. He, what, what he wanted to do was make sure that people understood that it was Christ's choice, you know, to, to be sort of the conquering heroic son. And, and, and I can't see bottom of Milton's view of freedom. It is as robust as any thinker I have ever read. It inflamed the imaginations of the writers of the American Constitution. You know, I mean, so you, I just can't, I can't even see bottom with, with the notion of freedom. And I think he, you know, that, that comes into play in his representations of the Trinity. He wanted to be sure that people understood that, that, that Christ chose, you know, to follow the Father. You know, that it was not any kind of determined thing. It was a, it was a moral choice. And, you know, Milton says that everything has to do with the choosing. You know, I, I've told my kids this, right, when you're trying to, trying to get them to learn moral lessons. I said, you know, every, every choice you make for the good brings about a, a change in you, right? It's, it's, it's in the choosing that we develop our virtue. And I, and I, I can get behind uh, Milton on that one. Yeah. Within the poem, well, you you are you are an elite. You are an, you're in an elite group. Oh, great. 
That's great. Ah, uh, that's a brilliant observation, I think. Uh, and I'm, 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 I was a little, with some fear and trepidation, I, I, I was hoping that, um, I, I was sort of hoping people understood why I include Thomas, not, not because I hold him up as being some orthodox theologian, far from it. It's just, it's the struggle to get what you're talking about that I find so interesting in his work. And, uh, and I too can relate to sort of being found where I least thought I would be found, which, and God has a funny way of finding us where we least want to be found. I mean, he really does. He seeks us out in some interesting places and in interesting moments and in interesting times. And so I'm, I'm glad that that, that, I mean, that's really one of the reasons why I included him. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Anything else for the good of the order? Well, it's good to be with you. Thank you very much for being so attentive and patient. I know that's all, that, I didn't mean to read the paper in such a tedious fashion, but uh, anyway, thank you for coming. <clears throat>